Good morning. Come on, good morning. That's yeah, a little bit better. Good morning. I'm so glad to be here uh, with you all this weekend. Thanks to Wheaton College, to the president, to the alumni office, to the chaplain for the opportunity to come and share with you this morning. Um, it's hard to be standing up here. I was used to sitting out there. I think I had a seat like right about there on the end. Um, I actually called the um, the folks who were helping me coordinate everything for my visit this weekend, and I asked them to help me find one of my chapel seats so I could, you know, maybe wave at the person who sits in my seat 29 years later. And they didn't have records that went that far. But we are not going to use the O word. Here, time stands still. And uh, I'm so grateful to be back and have the chance to share with you all students, uh, faculty, staff, alumni, folks on live stream. Special shout out to the class of 1994 as we celebrate our, uh, our reunion this weekend. And so what I want to talk to you a little bit about this morning is my journey and some of my reflections on what life has been like since leaving Wheaton. I think when it comes to identity, that's something we all wrestle with uh, at all stages of life. So when we're in college, we're trying to figure out who we are, and then we get to the middle, which is where I'm told I am, and you look around and people are still trying to figure out who they are, and who they are might not be who they were before. So at the end of the day, I think there's hope for all of us. It's fluid, and only God defines us. And I think it's really important to remember that as we try to maybe follow the crowd or let someone else tell us who we need to be. Because I think at the end of the day, following someone who isn't quite sure who they are to tell me who I am probably means we're both in a lot of trouble. And so just keep in mind um, kind of where our hope, where our definition comes from. And so really briefly, I'll tell you about my journey. Questions I've asked, who am I? Who is my neighbor? And who am I to be in a rapidly changing world? 25 years, it's really hard to imagine that much time has passed, but at the same time, God is always doing new things, and I'm so grateful to be a part of that and to see what he's doing in and through us and the many opportunities that he gives us all to serve him wherever we are. And so 1994, a little bit of a flashback here. You'll see in the upper left corner, that's Pine. Does anybody remember Pine? Pine was the email system that we had. We could go to the second floor Blanchard and use a computer lab, and we all had our very own personal email account if we wanted it. It was quite exciting at the time. Um, 1994 was also the year that the uh, Netscape web browser was introduced. Uh, folks were rushing out to see the Shawshank Redemption. That was the year that Nelson Mandela became the president of South Africa. Um, MCI was one of the popular long-distance companies then. I'm assuming most of you students don't quite know what that is since we all have free long distance in our pockets. But back in those days, we used the phone that was wired in, and they charged us by the minute when we called very far away. And I know on more than one occasion, MCI got over $900 of my top money in a month because I was really homesick and called home a lot. But um, those were kind of a little bit of the context. So my Wheaton days, I think for all of us, this is a challenging, growing, changing time, so ups and downs. So uh, a few different photos that some of my classmates were kind enough to share. So I don't know if I'll be able to point. Did it change? It didn't change. It went the wrong way. Well, maybe we won't have pictures. There they are. So um, I lived in Fisher on 2 West. So where are my 2 West folks? Yes. Yes, I'm so excited that you all are here. Thank you all for all of your prayers for this morning. Um, a lot of the alumni in the class of 1994 and people all around the world have been praying for this morning, for our time together, and for each of you. And so I'm grateful that you're here, and I'm grateful to be here with you. So I lived in Fisher on 2 West. Uh, 5 East was our brother floor. We were sometimes... We're, that's it? Come on, guys. 5 East, anyone? And um, at that time, let's see, my roommates and probably the people who knew me before I came to college um, realized that I'm an entirely different person. I was the shyest person you've met, and I'm pretty sure that talking to three people at once was public speaking. And I liked it that way. I liked it that way, one-on-one, -on -one, small projects, small groups. And uh, standing in front of people was never something that I saw myself uh, as particularly interested in doing. I had a kind professor who saw a lot of potential in me who had this nasty habit of calling on me in class did not appreciate it, but in the end, it made me grow, and I learned quite a lot from him. And so in case you're wondering, that was me in the middle there, and those are my neighbors, I think, alphabetically, so our mailboxes were all close to each other throughout the four years. Uh, let's see, so a couple quick highlights. I told you about Two West. I went to the Black Hills. Um, five people went to the Black Hills? That's it? <laughs> you guys are killing me. We need some coffee in here. Um, also, let's see, have a few f uh, photos with a few other sweet mates, roommates, some of our antics and shenanigans. And uh, in the very 
bottom, let's see, oh, you, can, you might not be able to see it right next to the Badlands, is a photo of me with my sweet mates, uh, Jessica, Shelly, and Allison, and we're, they were more of the pranksters than I was. I was a very serious, studious pre-med student. I came to study, but there were always jokes and antics and mortifying things happening or things that made me a little bit more uncomfortable. But when you become a doctor, people talk to you about all kinds of things. <laughs> you suddenly really have to get over it. And so, you'll notice in that photo, if you're able to see it, we had our noses kind of all taped up, and only one person is not smiling ear to ear. Guess who that would be? The serious one. And so, um, part of my journey also was um, getting to know the Cisco family. Um, I was one of the co-founders of the one-to-one -one peer mentoring program. And, uh, see, they're awake. And um, that was an amazing growing and leadership experience for me, where I really got the chance to step up. Rodney kept making me stand in front of people and uh, teach and mentor. And it was a great chance to meet other people who were maybe sharing some of the same challenges and encourage them and to be encouraged by people who'd come ahead of me in a place where, honestly, most of the time I didn't quite fit in. There wasn't any one place that I fit in neatly. And sometimes I was really hard and really lonely. And um, Rodney Sisko and his dear wife, Hasana, reached out to me and so many other uh, students of color who were just trying to find our place in this particular space while trying to love God and grow better. And so those, um, they were definitely a big part of my Wheaton experience. So since Wheaton, of course, I graduated the summer after I went to Student Missionary Project, so SMP, anyone? Where's Ingrid? Great, thank you. Um, that was an amazing experience. <laughs> and then I went on to medical school residency, got the chance to serve in a number of medical missions projects and reconnect with many Wheaton friends uh, over the years. And once again, Rodney was a big part of that as well. Every time I came to campus, I would come to visit him. It's actually very strange to be here and not be able to make that one of my first stops uh, on campus. But um, God is faithful. And I think if there's one thing I can definitely tell you, whatever you're facing, God is faithful. I've read the back of the book. We win. And so at the end of the day, even if it's a bad day, we win. So keep that in mind, please. And I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Emily Langen and her persuasion class for sending up special prayers for me um, during a particularly challenging professional time uh, several months ago. So I just wanted to say hello. Sorry I couldn't come by this morning. I do appreciate your prayers. And I love the fact that we can belong to a body where across the years, across the miles, we can pray for each other. And so as I reflected on the psalm, I think the part that spoke to me the most was the last couple uh, verses that say, tremble earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. God provided for them at a time where there was no water. He made water, and I think wherever we go, whatever we face, he makes a way. And so I put this up here to kind of reorient me. This is what I'm gonna talk about. And one of the things I want you all to think about is what we think of when we look at other people. You know, maybe the, what they're wearing or where they've been, or just it's easy for us to make a lot of quick judgments. Now, some of them are really important, right? We would be overloaded with information if we processed every bit of data to the fullest. But some of those shortcuts that we make um, really can get us into a bit of trouble. And so, oops, let's see if we can go back. Will it go back? There it is. So I put this one up. I'm the same person. But we in the medical field, we like, like letters and honorifics and stuff. So if you go to a talk and the person has like rows and rows and rows of stuff introducing themselves, then they must be somebody with something to say. And um, so that being said, in a different setting, you know, if you show up with a slide that looks just like this, where it's just your name, they're like, oh, maybe this person's not very exciting. And so, I mean, maybe I'm not, who knows? That being said, I think at the end of the day, there is that place to be careful of being wrapped up in, in the trappings. I had a professor in medical school who told me, you know, you need to always wear your white coat, like to the bathroom and to buy coffee, or people will mistake you for housekeeping. And I thought he was being dramatic, but he actually wasn't wrong. And so I think at the end of the day, for all of us, there are places where we are quick to decide who someone might be or what they might be capable of without getting to know them. So just a couple really quick things. So I was born in Ghana, West Africa. I'm actually the daughter of immigrants. My dad came to the States to go to Bible college. And um, people ask me, you lived in Maryland, how'd you end up all the way in Chicago? And at the end of the day, um, I wanted to go to a Christian college, I wanted to go to a place with a strong pre-med program, and my dad said that at his Bible college, all of the books were written by people from Wheaton College. So, this must be the place to be. And so I gathered my bags and headed out to the Arctic, and I was gonna just stay four years and go back to where it's 55 degrees at Christmas time. And 29 years later, I still live in the Midwest. 
And I think when I went, when it comes to stones, I was thinking of happy, sunny things, you know, joy and everyone getting along and we were ushered in the kingdom. But there were a lot of other kind of stuff, you know, the stuff that's not really fun, bad things, you know, broken trust or rejection or disappointment. And God is always there. You know, Jesus always remains our cornerstone. Times we work really hard for something and it just seems to come apart. Um, but at the end of the day, I am so faithful that as the Cisco family motto says, Jesus is our cornerstone. And so we can always rest in that. But I think troubled times, we all have them, you know, might feel like quicksand, hurricanes, life burning down. And sometimes you feel like this is about all that's left. And so for me, we all have our stories. Um, for me, one of those times was December of 2017. And um, I lost my dad and it was very unexpected. I'm the oldest, I used to talk to him almost every day. And so for all of us, it was a really hard experience. But you know, our family faith is the core and we knew that we didn't walk alone. And we would say, you know, it is well, that was our closing hymn. And so even as we said goodbye, we worshiped. But the interesting thing was the time. Time moves fast, but it stands still. And people would always tell me, oh, just take it one day at a time. One day is a super long time, I did the math. I did the math, 86,400 seconds in one day. So, five seconds at a time, I decided that was good for me. When it came to hard things, five seconds is workable. On a good day, you can make it five minutes, whatever works for you. But five seconds was a good way to kind of make it through some of these challenges. And so from the, let's see if I, I like the math, I'm sorry. So from the 670 days since I said goodbye to my dad, which would be 57,888,000 seconds, or the 278 days since we said goodbye to my mentor, Rodney Sisko, 800 seconds, a lot happens. And I think it's just really important when things happen for us to pause and sit with it. It takes time, lots of tears, people to surround you, and know that even in the hard things, God is there. And so for me, I've definitely learned to grow and to see people um, a lot, lot differently. And to consider that even if I don't understand their experience, it's a very valid experience. I remember losing another mentor from medical school about eight or nine years ago and was not handling it well. And my supervisor basically came to me one day and said, you need to snap out of it and get back to work. And I was horrified. I was like, you know, I'm in medicine because this person has mentored me in so many ways. Like, you don't just get over it and get back to work. And I think the way that I felt that someone had kind of devalued my feelings or my experience was really hard. And I think um, quantifying other people's pain is potentially a really dangerous place. It, in medicine, we do that, right? You go in and they ask you if you have any pain and they also watch what you're doing. So if you say you're having 10 out of 10 pain, but you're doing somersaults and giggling in the exam room, you know, we kind of wonder what's going on because people in that kind of pain maybe hold real still. And I'll be honest, those of us who've been trained to do this, we don't even do it right all the time. And so at the end of the day, the challenge is, how do we treat others and see their pain? Um, I heard about a really sad thing that happened here where apparently a group of students shared their hearts and their pain and others didn't necessarily understand their pain or treat them the way that any of us, I think, would wanna be treated. And everyone's different. I wasn't here. I'm not calling, you know, calling names, pointing fingers. I think. What I'm saying is that everyone's pain is their own experience, be it because they've lost someone, because they've lost a job, because they don't feel like they fit in. And so it's really important for us to be very aware of the people around us. And I think that, um, you know, having spent a lot of time in higher education, there's a lot of discussion about disenfranchised groups and imposter syndrome. And I found this um, quote that really struck me in an article about um, actually women in technology and it said, what we call imposter syndrome often reflects the reality of an environment that tells marginalized groups that we shouldn't be confident, that our skills aren't enough, that we won't succeed. And when we do, our accomplishments won't even be attributed to us. Yet imposter syndrome is treated as a personal problem to be overcome, a distortion in processing rather than a realistic reflection of the hostility, discrimination and stereotyping that pervades tech culture. And I think at the end of the day, while there's a place for all of us to be confident in who Christ made us to be, there's also a place for us to look around and see the people around us and encourage them and make this a place in every place and space we go into that's not a hostile and more hurtful um, experience. In Luke chapter 10, we have this story that we all know well, the who's my neighbor. And um, so Jesus tells the story of this man who was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And of course he fell into the hands of robbers and they took his things. And so 
you know, he's there he is dying on the side of the road. Priest happens to be going down. He crosses over to the other side. Levite crosses over to the other side. And the Samaritan stops and bandages him and puts him on his own donkey. So he gave him a ride and he took him to the inn and a place where he could rest and recover. And he spent his own money to make sure that he was okay. And there are a lot of people in that story, right? There's the person who was beat up, who was, you know, maybe he was carrying gold bars at midnight. I don't know, was, you know, was it his fault? That's not really the point. But that person was theoretically minding their own business and this happened to them. And then there are the folks who crossed over. Maybe the priest was late for church. Maybe they have an elder meeting. Maybe somebody was rushing to like the soup kitchen. I don't know. But at the end of the day, they did leave that man there. And it's interesting that the scripture points out that it was the Samaritan that stopped. So even two centuries ago, the issues of race and ethnicity were noticeable to the point that Jesus raised them. And so I think when we think about who we are and who we are in Christ and who we are as a community, it's just really important to be aware of those things. Um, the demographics show that in the year 2042 in the United States of America, the population demographics are gonna shift such that the majority of the population will no longer be white. So people who are not white will be more than half of our nation's population in 2042. That means every student sitting in this room, when they come for their 25th reunion, our nation will look entirely different. And as a place where we can grow and learn and lead and change the world, I wanna know what we're doing to get ready. You know, I think Rodney talked a lot about reconciliation. And I would like to propose that before we can be reconciled one to another, we have to go back to God. You know, I think we talk about who we are. Most of you may know this history about Wheaton College being founded by abolitionists and Wheaton College was a stop on the Underground Railroad. This place was almost created to be a place where people who were other felt safe and had a chance to grow and learn. So Jonathan Blanchard, first president of Wheaton, Wheaton graduated one of the first African-Americans in the state of Illinois. William Osborne also received his degree here. So we actually have a really rich legacy. And I think for us, as we look to changes and we look to the world around us, it's really important for us to consider that this is our time to make a difference. And if we remain silent, I think that's not gonna be okay. Um, but we have a tradition of revival. I found this great book called uh, Accounts of a Campus Revival from events, you know, described events that occurred when I was actually here. After I graduated from Wheaton, I stayed in the area for a couple of years. And this book told about how there were amazing revivals, 1936, 1943, 1950. And out of those, Christian leaders rose up to change the world. 1970, there's a bit of a gap, 20 years. 1995, we're heading for 20 years, we're about due, guys. But revival means to wake up and live. And the idea of revival is about returning. This is homecoming, we've come back, we're returning, but I think we need to return to what we're truly called to do. Revival certainly creates an environment where we can come together and resolve differences and be committed to a common mission, which I would say we would all undoubtedly say is Christ and his kingdom. And so as, we, as I wrap up my remarks to you, um, I guess I just wanna say that whatever you're facing, wherever you've been, God is so faithful, he hasn't forgotten you, if you're struggling with who you are or where you fit in, go to God, find a safe space. The community that we are called to create, which can turn this world upside down, it takes work. It's not easy, it's hard, it's messy. But I think starting with ourselves and the things that we need to lay down before God gives us a starting point to return to one another. And so I guess I would leave you all with the, with the passage from Second Chronicles that says, if my people, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And so I just pray that this would be a place that 20, 30 years from now, we're gonna hear the stories about the things that all of you have done that have helped turn this place upside down. We are all working for Christ and his kingdom. But as we are ushering it in, I think we have to be ushers who are on the right page and focused on caring for those around us and being neighbors and knowing who our neighbors are. Get to know God, get to know yourself, but keep an eye out for the people around you. I think there's such amazing opportunities to learn and grow here, opportunities to be stretched. Some of it's kind of messy, like I said. It's not always fun when we kind of take a close look at ourselves. I mean, I got a few things I would rather none of you know about. Just a few. Um, but that being said, God is faithful and he's a God of grace. My pastor and his wife always say, people are people. 
and nothing more. But God is God and nothing less. God bless you. Okay. for you. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this Friday that we have to spend together. And I thank you that before the dawn of time, you knew about this day and about everything we would discuss. You knew what was going to be on our hearts and our minds on our way here. And I just pray that you would be with each and every person here. Touch our hearts. Show us where we need to leave things behind to cast off things that are slowing us down, that keep us from running hard after you. And I pray that you would just bring each one of us a little closer to yourself. I know I had lots of things to say, but I trust that each person left with one thing to be encouraged by, one thing that they can do differently. We have an amazing legacy for Christ and his kingdom, the opportunity to change this world for Jesus Christ. And I just trust that you would continue to equip us to do that. I thank you again for the opportunity to share with my brothers and sisters from all ages, all around the world. I thank you that you're good and that you love us very much and that you always, always, have better plans for us than we have for ourselves.